Hey everybody, I'm DJ Sixsmith. I'm here with Sarah Eisen. She's got a brand new documentary, Inside Track, The Business of Formula One. Sarah, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Happy to talk about this. So this documentary is fascinating. F1 is a global sports phenomenon, but you tell the story a little bit differently. So what was it like to tell the story and what inspired you to make the documentary? First of all, what inspired me to make the documentary were my kids, which I don't usually say as an anchor of business news on CNBC. But I have two young kids, five and four, and they are obsessed with Formula One. They watch every single race, they watch every single practice, they watch every single qualifying. And so it occurred to me that, that this is a real phenomenon and it's a bullish story if you're thinking like an investor or if you're thinking like a company, which increasingly companies are jumping into this sport and increasingly having conversations about Formula One. So between my kids and the companies we cover, everybody's very interested. So I set out on a journey to tell the story of the business of F1, everything from the acquisition of Liberty Media a few years ago to how they have completely flipped the script on the business and turned it into a behemoth. And whether it's through the marketing decisions or through their focus on the United States, we dive into those kind of decisions. And we also look at the commercial appeal of the sport and why companies are diving in. So F1 had been around for many decades. Liberty Media comes in in 2017, buys the Formula One group. So you hit on it a little bit, but how did they transform the business overall? They gave the drivers personalities. They let them be professional athletes. And with that came a lot of star power. And I think part of that was the decision to do Drive to Survive, the big Netflix show, which really let people in on the dramas and the personalities of these drivers and some of the team principals. But that is one example of how they, Liberty, rethought everything and completely changed the business of the sport. There's some really interesting financial details as well. How much are being spent on the engines, the marketing, the TV revenue? What was it like asking those specific questions? And what do you think will fascinate the audience the most? Well, what I loved about it is nobody else had been asking yeah. these questions. You know, a lot of there's a lot been made of Drive to Survive, but what we did on CNBC is something completely different, asking questions like, how as a team do you allocate revenue? How do you deal with the cost cap, which is another big big strategy shift around Liberty Media when they came in on the sport where teams aren't allowed to spend past a certain amount. It's The models really comes from American pro sports like the NFL to try to make the game more competitive. But what that ended up doing is making the teams a lot more profitable. So it was fun to talk about how the valuations have jumped on these teams, the profitability, and how basically these teams operate as any global business that we talk about here on Wall Street do when it comes to managing teams and managing loss. Well, speaking of teams, let's talk about Oracle Red Bull Racing because they are the dominant force right now. We spoke to Christian Horner. What are the biggest keys to their success at the moment? Well, they have an exceptional car and a generational talent as a driver yeah. in Max Verstappen. And you know, it's funny, I was trying to ask a lot of the, the team heads that I spoke to, is it the car or mm -hmm. is it the driver? Which one's more important? And I think universally they said it's the car, the car design. And that's what's so fascinating about Formula One. All these cars are secrets, they're proprietary. They design them themselves and they're, and they're incredible feats of technology and innovation and aerodynamics. And who has the, whoever has the best design at the moment is usually winning. So if you pair that with Max, who, nothing to take away from Max, he's an animal, he's incredible. Um, they, they really have the winning combo right now. But the other thing I learned is that it won't stay that way forever. It's happened before in the sport. Mercedes dominated for a really long time. And all the other teams upgrade their technology every single race, race to race, in the middle of the season. So speaking of Mercedes, they were the team on the top of the sport. Lewis Hamilton is featured in this documentary. Toto Wolff, you spoke to him. How did they try to get back on top? What was most interesting about those conversations? They're working really hard to get back on top because Lewis is an incredible driver. He's a longtime champion of the sport. Mercedes dominated for, for a really long time. And in a way, it's, it's funny. I, I compare these teams a lot to global businesses that we cover in the S&P 500. And they do have that winning combination of leadership and making the right decisions when it comes to Toto, getting Lewis from McLaren, you know, several years ago, they responded really well into the, I think it was 2014, new rules around hybrid engines, built a great car. So now they find themselves sort of behind Red Bull, and it's, it's so competitive between Toto and Christian that it was kind of fun to talk about the rivalry there. But I think Toto and Lewis feel like if they can get the car right, 
Lewis is on top of his game, and then they can really compete. So they're making changes. Now, most people know about Formula One from Drive to Survive. When you think about what that did for the sport, it comes in in 2019 on Netflix, and all of a sudden now there's new marketing deals, there's new sponsorship. How did it change the business element of Formula One? Drive to Survive was a game changer for Formula One. It put F1 on the map in America. F1 was always very popular in Europe, in South America, and part of the Liberty strategy has always been to grow it in the U.S. During COVID, when everyone was at home binging Drive to Survive, it completely changed the calculus. It's why they have now added a third race in the United States. So the, so the growth plans come, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's remarkable for a league that already has more than 20 races around the year, they're continuing to grow. Miami has been for two years and now Vegas to a third race. So demand for tickets, demand for viewership, but also just watching and, and ratings. They made a TV deal with ESPN, a rights deal, after the success of Drive to Survive, which was much richer than it would have been before Drive to Survive. It changed the eyeballs on the sport because it gave the drivers personality and made them relatable. And we saw how fun it was to actually follow some of the rivalries and the dramas and, and all of that. And I think another good example that we explore in this doc, which I'm excited for you to see, is Gunther Steiner. He's the head of the Haas team, the MoneyGram Haas team. They're a team that doesn't win any championships, constantly from behind, and yet are scoring these major deals with sponsorships. We, we dive into the MoneyGram partnership and how that sort of rescued them from some bad partnerships beforehand. He's become a sensation and a personality, and people love him because of Drive to Survive. And I don't think a, for a team like Haas, that would have been possible before that. And there's not many other sports where a team that's not at the top would have a big star like that. So you have that element. And then you have the big race in Vegas, which is November 19th. Mm -hmm. It's the one that's scheduled on everybody's calendar. You go into the whole story about how this came together, the failures in the 80s with Sin City. What is most fascinating about F1 trying to do Vegas once again with all the money and effort being put towards it? Well, I think what's fascinating is all the money and effort because usually how it works in the business of F1, and, and I do get into this in the film, is that there's a local sponsor. So F1 wants to do a race in Miami, there's a sponsor. That is a group of people that invest. They did it in the Dolphin Stadium. They built all the grandstands. They built all of the paddock club, which is where the VIPs sit. They build the, race, the track, everything. They sell the tickets. They're in charge of the whole race. What's different about Vegas is that Liberty Media is assuming that role of promoter, which means there's a lot on the line. And they've spent a ton of money, which we dive into exactly how much to make this project come to a reality. So. It's risky, they're using a lot of money, but it's also potentially, I think, shows the reward they see in just going big and going flashy, which is a constant theme in the sport and one that Liberty has really done in America in a way we've never seen before. And that's what Vegas represents. Yeah, so F1 is making a lot of moves. You have F1 Academy as well, which brings women into this whole thing. What does the future of women look like in terms of those women on the grid trying to become a bigger force in the sport. It's clearly a priority for all of the management team at Liberty and at F1. And the fact that it's run by Susie Wolf, who's Toto Wolf's wife, and also a, a former professional racer herself, it shows that there's a lot of there's a lot of priority being placed on this effort to bring in F1 Academy basically brings in young female drivers into the sport to try to get them interested. It's a, it's a high, it's a hard sport to get into. It's expensive, it's usually men. So they're trying to break down some of those barriers and increase accessibility and relatability to the sport. And because it's such a priority for F1 and the teams themselves, I mean, rarely there was a, a sit down interview that I did for this documentary where people did not point to F1 Academy as a way to make this sport more inclusive. And what I'm told is that the fastest growing demographic in terms of viewers of F1 races are young women. I believe it, 50% of the population. It's great to see. Should be. Yeah, absolutely. Lastly, you got to do a hot lap with Total Wolf. Yes. What was that experience like? Because people pay a whole lot of money to try to do that. So it was, it was scary, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And my heart was racing for maybe 48 hours afterwards. I believe it. But yeah. I would do it again in a second. And I understand why people pay a lot of money because it's, it's such a thrill. But it also gives you a sense of just how crazy fast these, these drivers were going. It feels like nothing I've ever done. And, and the turns, like where the car lifts off the ground, pretty wild. Well, Sarah, thank you for the time. Inside Track, the business of Formula One, Thursday, November 16th at 8 Eastern on CNBC. We'll see you next time.